Hello and welcome to this Edison audio interview. I'm Joanne Collins from Edison and I'm joined today by Catherine Young, Investment Director at Fidelity Asian Values Trust. Catherine joins us from her base in Hong Kong. Hello and welcome, Catherine. Hi, Joanne. Nice to speak to you. Thank you and likewise. Can you start off perhaps by telling us how things are in Hong Kong at the moment? How is that, that economy recovering from the coronavirus crisis? It's interesting, Joanne, when we look at across global markets, we're, we're kind of looking at three key drivers. The first driver is the flattening of the COVID curve. The second, the sustainability of an economic recovery. And, and third, it would be policy response and implementation. So if we look at either Hong Kong, China, South Korea, so in general, the North Asian countries, and then also Australia, then from a flattening of the COVID curve perspective, they're actually doing all very, very well relatively speaking, and especially versus, let's say, Southeast Asia, so ASEAN, as well as India, where we are still seeing a spike in cases. So just taking Hong Kong and China in particular, you know, when we do see any additional breakouts, the, the rapidness in terms of containment is very, very quick. So when we look at the tracking, the monitoring, the testing, it's, it's quite staggering how quickly things are getting done. And so I think from that first driver perspective, you know, a tick, especially for China, Hong Kong, uh, South Korea also doing very, very well, as I mentioned, the pace of the economic recovery, China really is in the lead here. So, you know, back to normal. In fact, when we, when we look at the COVID situation in certain cities like in Hangzhou, Shanghai, people aren't even wearing masks anymore. So the risk really is that we do see the second wave because of complacency. So again, when we look at the second driver, a tick, and then finally policy response, the PBOC or the central bank in China has really gone in a different direction to most other global central banks in terms of the policy response. So they were somewhat accommodative during the first half, but even monetary policy wise, we've seen them coming back to a very neutral stance. And even fiscally, we only saw sort of tweaking regarding supportive measures again versus the rest of the world. So, you know, again, take all three drivers or, or sort of prongs and uh, China in particular is doing incredibly well. Fidelity Asian Values has been managed by Nitin Bajar for more than five years. Um, what are the issues most occupying his mind at the moment, do you think? Oh, Joanne, I mean, that's it's, it's the, Nitin as well as another portfolio manager who we work with in Asia, they're quite unique when it comes to investing in this part of the world insofar as they have a value style bias and contrarian as well. So with Nissan's value contrarian style bias, he's also looking at the small cap space more so than let's say the large caps. What's happened is that we've seen this really crowded trade emerge, not just this year, but even last year. In fact, we've seen the growth rally go on for over 10 years, but it really did become extreme we would argue uh, in 2020 and again this year. And if you look at markets such as China again, because it's such a large market, because it's such an important market now in the region, what's happened is that it's just a, all the investors, whether institutional or retail, are all buying the same names. And they're high growth names. They tend to be in sectors such as big tech or biotech. Even if we look at other markets across ASEAN, South Korea, we get a lot of thematic traders coming in and a lot of them are retail investors. So the retail participation rate in terms of daily turnover is over 90% in some of these markets. And they're all buying names, not based on fundamentals, but on this trend. And this trend is really sort of skewed towards high growth. So I guess for someone like Nissan as an investor who's sticking so disciplined in terms of his process, you know, what, what does he do in terms of his investment objectives or what he looks for in a company? It's, he wants to buy a good business, um, good management team at a good price. But unfortunately, so many of these names that fit into that category are just being overlooked by the market because of this, again, emergence of a very crowded trade. So I guess for someone like him, you know, what could be the catalyst? Um, some people say you don't realize a catalyst until it's like six months down the track. Uh, but in terms of, um, you know, probably again, and, and using three drivers, uh, bond yields, rising, this is global bond yields, so i.e. inflation comes back, mm -hmm. global demand, and we could see this coming through, especially with positive news flow about the vaccination. Mm -hmm. And then finally, this shift in market participation. 
and where investors are currently uh, sort of placing all their assets or, or, or their trade and gains in that high growth area. On other background issues related to the uh, the trust and considerations that the manager has at the moment. Uh, do you expect the uh, US-China trade and political relations to improve under President Biden? It's tricky. And don't forget the, the US-China trade dispute or tensions have been in place for three years now. So, you know, when we look at what caused this tension? It was really the Chinese companies and manufacturers climbing up the value chain, really competing now with companies, especially again in manufacturing, that have tended to be dominated by the US guys. And so with this competition, we've seen this change of relationship. So even though Biden has won, we're probably gonna see maybe um, sort of less, uh, tweets coming out and maybe more predictable policies mm -hmm. and potentially a, an improving relationship but the status quo isn't going to change significantly to the pre-Trump days just because of where China is now at in terms of you know they've made no secret that they're really climbing this value chain manufacturing wise. Are there any other political developments in Asia that you're watching particularly closely at the moment? Not so much political relationships. I mean, from a corporate perspective, it's it's very interesting because we do see a lot of um, synergies, whether it's between the Taiwanese corporates and the Chinese corporates, whether it's in the biotech space, etc. So that's a that's a real positive. There was a free trade agreement that was big news that came out over the weekend uh, between uh, you know the ASEAN countries, China, Australia, India wasn't included, by the way. But this was sort of like, like 10 years or eight years in the making. And it just sort of is a further framework for some of the trade deals that we've already seen going on. But of course it's timely given that we have this sort of um, highlighted or continued highlighted trade issue or relationship between the US and China. But I think Joanne, in, in the sort of the, the, the world we're gonna find ourselves in, in in 2021, most countries are probably reassessing or recalibrating the trade deals they have with others. Recent performance of the fund has been disappointing in part because of the underperformance of the value focused investment strategies that you've mentioned. Uh, what are the companies that have detracted from returns of the trust and, uh, and also those that have enhanced performance over the last six months or so? Yeah, so if we just you know, again, look at the, the underlying attribution, and whilst it's very much driven by stock selection, it's interesting because Nitin as an investor is short momentum, i.e. he's underweight the names that have done very, very well given this growth bias. His star bias has actually hurt performance over the year. If we look at individual countries, uh, Korea, again, because of that thematic approach I mentioned earlier, so some biotech companies just trading at really, really rich valuations, but the fundamentals aren't there. Um, being not exposed to them has detracted from performance. Indonesian names, now Indonesia, because it's in the Southeast Asian region, um, as again, the COVID flattening curve hasn't really occurred yet. Uh, there are some question marks about economic recovery. So it's been a really overlooked market. So some of the names are still delivering on their earnings, but again, investors haven't been paying attention to them. Having said that, there's one company in, fast, in um, Indonesia called Fast Food um, Indonesia, and it had weaker than expected results. And what this company does is they own the franchise for KFC. And so given it's a quick service restaurant, given we've been in this period of COVID, um, not too surprising that the earnings were weaker. Another company called Powertech also had a slight downgrade as technology demand has slowed. But on the whole, the stocks or the names within the portfolio have seen reasonable results in the last reporting season we've had, but they continue to rate, or derate, de I should say, versus the market. In terms of the positive side, um, you know, again, it's, it's names like, there's an Indian pharmaceutical name called Granules. And so the thing about this company is, it's a leading producer of high volume, low value pharmaceutical products, such as paracetamol. And the key strength of this company is that they do business for a limited number of products on a really big scale. And this in turn helps keep um, cost of productions low. They've invested in all sorts of capabilities, 
and capacities in terms of their business. Um, so they've moved not just from, you know, generic pharma company, uh, uh, medication like uh, Panadol, they're moving into oncology, et cetera. So that sort of biotech space. So that's done well because it probably falls into that biotech name, but it's also delivering on earnings. There's also a company listed in, in ASEAN, which um, makes, for example, uh, gloves. So all the protective gear uh, during this COVID period. And just finally, what key messages would you like to leave with investors right now? It's been a really tough period, uh, not just for, again, a fund manager who's value small cap, but any kind of contrarian investor who hasn't been in those high growth names and that very crowded trade. I, you know, I mentioned the three drivers earlier about what could potentially see this catalyst or be the catalyst for a rotation. We have had short spurts of a rotation back into value. We're actually going through one now. It's worth noting that momentum is the greatest at the end of a growth cycle. Um, you know, again, not surprisingly, if we see all the retail investors start coming into the market because they don't want to be left out. Mm. So what's really important in, in this kind of scenario is maintaining your, your process that has worked in previous cycles and markets. Mm. It's maintaining his um, you know, mantra, which is buying good business, it's run by good management at a good price. And as long as the earnings are coming through and he's not falling into value traps, then hopefully 2021 will see this rotation back. Because to be honest with you, the, the extreme difference between growth and value, it, it's, it's really startling. Mm. Um, we haven't seen this kind of divergence or extremeness since 1998. And this is globally too, but it's, very, it's also very accentuated in, in markets such as China. So it's probably at this juncture, you know, it makes a bit of sense for investors to have, yes, their growth names and these technology names that everyone really likes because of, of the technology revolution that we're going through and innovation, et cetera, but to also have a bit of diversification through those names that are still delivering, as I mentioned, but again, it's, they're just in areas that people aren't paying attention to. So, so earnings certainty or earnings visibility in terms of trying to gauge that, the dividend yield on companies, the strong balance sheets, that's what we're really looking at at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, that's a, perhaps a more positive note to end on. So Catherine, thank you very much for speaking us, to us today. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us as well. Goodbye.